Oh, uh, hi, hi there, hi there. Um, I, I, I'm Dribble Soundo. Uh, I've, I've, I'm here for the uh, Monty's Inside the Jar interview. Yes, uh, sorry, Drimbles, was it? Drimbles, yes. Spell how it's pronounced. Okay, see, I, I was under the impression that we were we were having a different interviewer for this. The thing about the other interview is uh, he's kind of away on a legal matter at the moment, so they, they've sent me instead. Well, uh, do, do you have the pre-approved list of questions? He was supposed to send those to me, but I uh-huh. think they got seized with the other things in the um, in the legal matter. It, maybe we can we can postpone. I mean, how how long is this legal matter, as you call it, supposed to take to resolve? Three to six months. Thank you for having me. H- how would you how would you like to start? Well, I I, I don't have the pre-approved questions, but I've definitely got uh, some questions. So the the first question I've got here from the list is mm-hmm. in what way are you affiliated with the Nazi party? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I beg your pardon? The thing I've got here is something about uh, Nazi affiliations. Right, see, uh, <clears throat> let me just uh, I, see, my understanding was that we would start with sort of softball questions and, and then build up to, to some meatier stuff. Th- these aren't softball enough for you? Could, could we soften it? So- soften a bit. Um, uh, what in what way would you say that you are linked to a far right party from early nineteen thirties Germany? I d- see that 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 is something that I, that I wouldn't say, and I, again, just a little a little softer. We can this can be cut, right? This part you can. Oh yeah, like I'll I'll hire someone to edit this for me. I don't know how to actually work this machine. They just gave it to me and just press it into my chest and went press the big red button and then press it again to stop it. That that was all I got told. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, thank thank God for that. So again, just softer, you know, uh, fluffy kittens. Softer. Stuff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, would you say that you like to wear uniforms? Uh, yes, yes, I, I would actually. I think With swastikas on them. It would, uh, <laughs> no, I I wouldn't say that. Look, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a question. Uh, j- just just ask me what what I've been up to recently. Yeah. Um, so what have you been up to? Stamping on any kittens? Uh, goose stepping? Just learning anything like that? Or oh, sorry, I'm really sorry. Mm-hmm. I've just realised. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The questions that I have been given were for someone else. Yeah, no, I was supposed to be interviewing the guy who Lee Mack interviews on that woodworking show. Um, oh, the, yes! Oh, okay. So, oh, right. It's all Sorry. just some kind of misunderstanding. Yeah, this, this is okay, a misunderstanding. Right. Cool. No, this is so, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I've, I've got a different set of questions here. On how <laughs> much Nazi gold was Monty's all star jam jar made? To my knowledge, none. But the, the provenance of, of all of the money, I can't necessarily account for our... Our accounting process does involve just sort of a, a teapot full of money that we all occasionally put a, a few quid into here and there, and it it, it comes and goes. Um, whether any of it was of sort of Reich origin, I I can't specifically say, but not not to not to my knowledge. With, with the teapot, though, do you, have you ever had an incident where you go to boil a kettle and like money has come out? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, on multiple occasions. You see. The problem here is that is that we've become we've become fixated on on the Nazi issue, and I I just like to un- understand if there's some kind of some kind of medium ground of questioning where I I can give substantial answers about Monty's All Star Jam Jar, but it's not about Nazis. No, no, because we're building a rapport right now. I I can't allow that to happen. You see, I've got a reputation to maintain. Th- this is this is rapport building. This yes, is this is building a rapport. This is what I understand to be building a rapport with you for the interview. And it's three to six months for the other interviewer. Th- well, it depends if they get him on the other stuff I'm not allowed to talk about. That I, carries yeah, another 14 okay. years. I see. Right. Which is which is weird when you think about it, because she was only 12, so... The... I... I, I, I don't even feel that I should I should respond to that. We'll, we'll, we'll continue. Are there, are there any questions that you have prepared that are about the show? Okay, let me, let me just check my notes here. Uh, one question I, I do have here is that uh, were you to schism the group, say that you were to marry Tiff and there was like an alimony thing and she won half of the uh, show in like a, you know, a, a settlement, like a sitcom-esque yeah. Yeah. split okay. the apartment in two... Mm-hmm. How would you, like, cope with Monty's all-star, or as the title may break out, 
Star Jam Jar. So in, in terms of di- dividing up the show in the in the event that anyone breaks away, I installed a fail-safe mechanism into the way that the show contractually is, is divided at the time of its devising. I own the rights to most of the top 100 words in the English language when used in the in the context of Monty's All-Star Jam Jar. So your if, and, or, an, a, the, but in both spellings. Oh, like with an accent over the U. I, I don't think you understand what I meant, but sure. So in the event that anybody should attempt to form what I would call a breakaway group, a la Queen, the Eagles, so on and so forth, they would be obliged to either give me the rights and ergo royalties of every usage of those words in the show, crippling them financially well beyond their means to sustain, or alternatively to try and devise the show without using any of the, the common conjunctions or devices that allow you to identify objects yourself or the relationship between things, which for sketch comedy is an is an absolute death blow. So, for example, you could prevent, say, Richie from being able to say it anywhere with the letter E in it. Uh, yes, yes. Within the context of the show, Richie is one of the most used words. So, again, it would not be possible for Richie to be identified as Richie. So he wouldn't even have rights over his own name, is what you're saying? Yes, yeah. And and likewise, uh, the character of Frank Dinner. So Frank is okay, but Dinner is a very highly used word, so it would be necessary to change the name of the character. And I I think we all understand that the brand recognition of, of Frank Dinner, there's a lot of dinner pun work in there. Frank Lunch isn't a very funny name. Well, so. wouldn't, wouldn't he be able to like override that by, say, having an accent over the E? Oh, uh, Frank Dinner and so forth. No, 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 no. Um, so it's not phonetic, then? It's the actual, like, literal letters? Uh, it, yes, and I think in a, in a court of law, that kind of attempt at loophole finding and, and frankly, jiggery-pokery wouldn't, wouldn't stand up to, to the scrutiny of, of my many lawyers. So, for example, like, uh, Nana Sophie wouldn't be able to own any of the songs that she has done. Well, uh, here we get into a complicated copyright question that's uh, probably outside of the scope of this interview. But within the context of Monty's All-Star Jam Jar, if she goes on stage and it says that above her head, if she puts it out under that title, if she scrambles the letters of that title around, so it's Moronti Jar Star Jum, no. None of the none of these things would be permissible without my express say so. But in that case, do they at least get like adequately compensated for the fact that were they to leave, they would basically be held over a barrel over the Niagara Falls in a hot air balloon from the stratosphere. You've basically like put them over a comical barrel. Yeah, no, absolutely not. And I think one of the things to understand about the the comedy industry is that is that most people involved in it are not savvy at, at reading legal documents. And I, I would encourage anyone in my position to exploit that to, to the absolute fullest extent. Big fan of barrels, though. What would you say is your favourite kind? I, I don't know the formal name for them. But those ones that you see on kind of like old-timey boats where they're banded around the outside. Oh, the like Donkey a, Kong barrels, yes. The Donkey Kong barrel, yeah. yes. I've never understood how he got those. It doesn't seem like the kind of thing that he would have use for. Really? Well, it's the no. thing that also does make sense is, like, in Donkey Kong, they're on a girder. Like, they're on a construction site. So yeah. why would they have so many... Like, if you know what I mean, like, you can't build a skyscraper out of, like, apple barrels. So well, I mean, Certainly you could try, but I don't think you'd get very far. I, is there some way that we could bring this back around to, to the subject of, of the show? I... Um, what would you say is the funniest kind of barrel? <sighs> I, I don't see our humour as very barrel focused. If, if I had to pick a funniest kind of barrel, I guess one of those tiny ones that they keep the whiskey in. Is it a cask? or I, I don't know the word for them. Small things are funny. Speaking of whiskey, there was a, a sketch in the Pantheon of Monty's All-Star. Uh, Indeed. Timmy and the Whiskey Factory. Yeah. Uh, I believe that was written by uh, an Ed Price of uh, some it kind. Was, it was indeed. Um, yeah. So he wouldn't even own rights over that sketch. Oh, the, sorry, the historical works. The historical works, certainly people, people are fully entitled to. And if they, if they want to go out there uh, in, in 20 or 30 years' time and do some, I don't know, lame duck O2 show where they just rehash the quote-unquote greatest hits of Monty's um, for a bunch of sycophants, then I welcome their decision to, to do so. I, so he wouldn't be able to do the same sketch word for word. It would be like a never-say-never-thunderball situation where... 
he has to like recruit Sean Connery. Oh, sorry, it's Sean Connery's there, so he'd have to recruit a Sean Connery lookalike of some kind uh-huh. to go on and go, Osh, my name's Bond, James is Bond. Uh, yes, yeah, I think that that, that would be necessary. Uh, I, I mean, certainly, you know, by then, I think Sean Connery would have would have passed away, had he not tragically already. Cool, so that, that answers the bulk of the questions I have. Um, so, one question I do have here is, uh, would you like a stick of gum? I, uh, yes, yes, certainly, I, w- I wouldn't mind one. Okay, that's that's a shame I don't have any gum on me. Then why did you ask? To build the rapport. I was meant to pick some up from the store, but I, I, I tried and they were all out of Juicy Fruit, they were out of, like, Wrigley's. They, they, they just, let's just say they are out of, like, the bubbly ones and the chewy ones. Right, right, it's, right but it, it's unimportant which gums they did or didn't have. Why would you ask me if you don't have any gum at all? I was told that was a way to build rapport. I think that probably that is dependent upon the having of gum to give to the person you're offering it to. That would make a lot of sense, and would explain why that old lady hit me on the way here. I, I think there could be any number of explanations for that. You said that you're mostly out of questions at, at this point, point. I just want to try and understand that. So, you asked me questions about Nazi affiliations that were from the incorrect set of questions. Yep. You asked me a couple of questions about... Monty's All-Star Jam Jar, which effectively I prompted you to ask. There was a weird segment where we talked about barrels, and then you offered me some gum that you didn't have, and and that's that's what, that's the end of the interview, is it? If I could ask the Nazi questions, I'd probably get like another 10 minutes material out of this, but like, I, again, I wasn't briefed. Uh, were, were the other person here? Can I, can I ask whether you've ever seen, or well, I should say heard, the show Monty's All-Star Jam Jar? I think you can imply from the fact that I've gotten some of the names right that I've had the intern listen to them. I see, okay. And and in that, do you think that it would be possible for you to come up independently with, with some other questions that relate to the show? I, I could give it a try. I okay, mean, please, please. I, you, know. you, you, you mentioned that earlier that there were pre-approved questions. Do you think you'd be able to tell me some of those? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I did, I did write them. Um, one of them was, was regarding the, the sketches that we couldn't air. Oh, right. Okay. Well, before we get onto that, I, I want see, to yep. ask a very hard hitting question of you, which right. is, how are you? You know, there's a lot going on right now in yeah. the world. I just, I just want to make sure that you're okay. Well... It's it's not it's not been the easiest time, you know. Uh, okay, that sounds like that's going to get a bit deep right now. I don't think we really have time for that. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, another question I do have is um, uh-huh. something that the intern picked up on is that there is uh, a running thing in the show that yeah. in scenes in which you and Richie are present. Uh, the office is like ramshackle and you're in like Dickensian poverty of some kind. Uh, y- yes, yeah, yeah. And in sketches where they say a Price character shows up, who sounds very handsome, by the way. Um, he is. Yeah, he, I can't deny it. The, the show is like fabulously wealthy. You've got like, you know, gold pillars, piles of women. We couldn't... Well, by we, I mean, again, the intern, I had him listen to it. I I don't have 10 hours. Who does? Yeah, of course. Um, I, I've never listened to it myself. So you never even listen to your own show? No, I, I'm familiar vaguely with, with what's in there, but, I mean, again, who has 10 hours? Yeah, no, that's, that's fair enough. I, I think the problem is I keep trying to do it consecutively, and I, I have a full work day in between, you know? like This takes up your whole day? Surprisingly, yes. I, I am surprised. Well, you know, I've got to come up with the questions, I've got to go to the place, I've got to interview the person... You know, just like, it's it's a lot of things to do, you know, and then I've got to go back, I've got to give the intern, like, the recording. Uh-huh. Uh, actually, he is he is away at the moment. That's going to be another five to six months. It turns out that there were some things on that hard drive that, ha- you know, the serendipitous thing is that I got the intern to look at the hard drive, because, so, you know... No, I'm, that's fortunate, yeah. Yeah, so... You wouldn't, um, you wouldn't want to be implicated in any of that, I don't think. I, I, I don't know what they're being implicated in. All I know is that every time I ask, I am told to get my... Uh, the I think the phrase that comes up is, uh, shut the fuck up, Drimbles, get out of here, go interview that twat Danny. Well, uh, yeah, no, uh, this, has been, uh, this has been educational. I think that I can answer the question about the, the Ed Price sketches being put together with, with an audibly much higher budget. And um, it, it's, it's effectively because Ed funds his own sketches. So 
all of the the kind of ramshackle poverty, the Amstrad emailer, is our genuine source of, of email and point of contact for our fans. That That is the Monty's office as it exists, and, and we're very into the kind of verite depiction of it. Ed has loftier ideas um, for, for a lot of his creative output and has decided to, to bankroll all of his sketches individually. So the, the dichotomy that you hear between the budget, the, the seeming lapses in, in continuity and sense between one episode in which we have a, a majestic cheesy ball fountain, the elephants, a gladiatorial arena, so on and so forth, those things do exist, but only in the context of those sketches being recorded. And, wh- and where does he get the money from? Uh, my understanding is that he steals it from Gina, and um, she she just hasn't noticed. Fair enough. If I'm to understand correctly then, so you go to do a sketch, yeah. and then it's an Ed Price sketch, as you say, and he brings all the stuff onto the set? Like, he well, brings yeah, these pillars not, and fountains? Not him, and... not him personally, you know. A, a team of, of people, I mean, typically, I, I don't ask um, where he gets them from, but typically a lorry will drive up at about three o'clock in the morning. Um, we won't have been notified ahead of time, and they'll start unloading sort of Greek columns, busts, sometimes of Ed in, in various states of, of undress. Fountains, further assistants unfolded from boxes to rebox all of our things that have been in the office, for they offend his taste. And over the course of about seven or eight hours, I'd say that um, they prepare the, the stage for Ed's arrival. We, we have questioned on, on multiple occasions um, why it's necessary for a radio show to have uh, erotic nudes, fountains, exotic animals, so forth, present on the, on the set. Um, but, but Ed is extremely insistent, and since he's bankrolling it, we, we don't have the heart to stop him. And do you find that these additions actually increase the audio quality of the podcast? Or Oh, the audio quality, heavens no. No, I, I can't explain to you how difficult it is to get the sound of peacocks out of a out of a sketch that is just two people talking. But they're extraordinarily loud. I don't know if you've I don't know if you've seen them in person. They're extraordinarily loud. But I, it's it's really either that or, or we can't have the the Ed sketches in there, and they they form such a such a backbone of of the Monty's experience that we couldn't afford to lose them. But can you just get him to? For example, use less of his own money for his own sketches and give some of that money... Well, I say his own. Gina's, apparently. He couldn't just get some of Gina's money to the rest of the sketches and improve those somewhat. So I, what I'm hearing here is is the voice of someone who has never attempted to kind of negotiate with, with Ed Price. He doesn't do terms. He, he doesn't do back and forth. It's very much his way or the, or the highway. And ha- has he ever gone on the highway? Or I I seem to recall an incident in which he he stole a car near the near the end of the last season. Whether he drives outside of that, I I'm I'm not aware. Hmm, interesting. Does having to take down the set does that take up a lot of time? Does that affect the rest of the show? Like oh oh ma- massively yeah. Uh, we have to we have to set aside effectively an an, an entire day for every Ed sketch that we want to do. And I don't, I don't mean a working day, I mean a, a full 24-hour period for the setup, the takedown, the inevitable orgies that spring up um, as, a, as a result. It, it can be challenging and it can be taxing, but I think in the end the, the results speak for themselves and I, I wouldn't want to deny that to our audience. You said that one of the uh, things that you had agreed with the other interviewer, whose yep. name I can't even say for legal reasons, I think you might have to beef out the fact that I've even mentioned another mm. interviewer. Yeah, something about sketches that you couldn't air. Uh, yes, yeah, and uh, there have been there have been a few. I'm not even sure how they got banned because ultimately we don't have any kind of any kind of broadcast agreement. But these brown letters would just arrive in all very official language, stating explicitly. I mean, we we record these in the office. As far as I'm aware, nobody can hear what's going on in there. But the brown letters would arrive, and they would say, "Look, you you can't put this out there, in in any form. No return address, no indication of where they were from." But we we thought if they've got the power to do that, it's probably best not to disobey them. 
And, and what kind of sketches would they stop then? Would they wait until you're recording and then the envelopes come through, or would it be like after you're like editing it, sort of thing? It, it was normally by the time that we that we've made it to the editing process, there were a few that were just kind of sitting on the shelf. We didn't know quite what to to do with them, and with those, I think frankly, it was a relief. You know, we, we, we couldn't find a, a home for them. When they said, look, you can't broadcast that, we thought, oh, thank God, no, now we don't feel obliged to, you know. But yeah, it, it was it was surprisingly variable which ones would get picked up on. I mean, there were there were a few that were that were very kind of blatantly anti-government to the point of almost being, I'll, I'll say it, I'll say that they were almost extremist in their anti-government sentiment. I can, I can understand why those were banned. But there was one that was sort of anti-dog in its tone, and that was banned as well. And I, I can't quite understand the logic behind that. I, I mean, you're, you're going to have to explain to me how a sketch can be anti-dog and still funny. I, I, can, I can give you the brief conceit. It was a kind of argument between gods, and one of the gods was kind of the progenitor of cats, one of the gods was the progenitor of dogs, and the gods had the corresponding personalities of, of the animals. And I mean, we made the dog god just really... Really such a dick. I mean, a, a complete idiot, gullible, easily led, susceptible to, to the whims of others. I mean, we, we really painted a, a caricature of, of dogs that, could they speak or understand it, would be completely unacceptable to them. Fair enough. And, and so that one got stopped as well, you say? There was like a brown envelope through the door? Yes, yeah. Although I... After a while, I did start to suspect, given their, their kind of unknown provenance, that it was... Somebody within Monty's who just it didn't like these these sketches and then was delivering them to sort of veto bomb them from the inside, if you like. That actually brings up one of the things that the intern, who again I'm not even sure at this point I can mention, I'm I'm getting furious texts from someone. The, like, the intern too, my god. Yeah, well, yeah, he like I say, he he, he looked at the at the hard drives as well. Oh, that's so. uh, I guess that makes you almost complicit. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, I told him to look at the hard drives. I didn't know there was anything on there until, like, mm. obviously, you know, someone in the suit comes along and they say, "Have you looked I, at the hard drive?" And you know, you've skimmed it. I've not actually looked. Yeah, no, like, I'm, I'm sure at some point someone will interview you about that story. God, I hope not. Indeed. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you you had kind of a run in as well. There was a sketch deleted due to something like the prime minister or like the president or what well, was like that, but you know bigger and gets more money, but doesn't actually do anything. Uh, the the royals, so the queen. Ah, oh, yes, the queen. Um, so how was it working with Freddie Mercury? The no, no, the the queen, Queen Elizabeth, not Queen Freddie Mercury. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. I, I did wonder how you managed to do that, considering that he's been dead for 30 years. But, you know, he, maybe you found a way. Well, he was in that film. They, they did in that film. Yeah, exactly. He was in that film recently. But I just assumed that was CGI. Yes, I, I frankly, I, I don't know uh, how they did that. But the queen that we had on, on Monty's All-Star Jam Jar was the, the monarch of the United Kingdom, Queen Elizabeth II. And it, it's a it's an incredible story, really. We We had no idea at all that Her Majesty was was a listener, but one day we received a, a telephone call and nobody nobody ever calls the offices, you know, and we thought that it was a prank at first, obviously, as as you would, you know, you have the you have someone on the other end of the phone going, Hello, hello, Ponty's All Star Jam Jar, I'm the Queen and you think, Yeah, fuck off. But as it turned out, after we uh, verified everything, it, it was the Queen herself, and she asked to be included in an episode of the show. Did she forgive you after you told her to fuck off? That, well, I, I, I said it, you know, into, into my hand, so it just sort of sounded like interference on the line or something. I, I don't think she hears particularly well, you know, but well for her age, well for her age. And how old is she now? That, oh, I I have no idea. I mean, you can go by the sort of officially published figures, but you're not going to believe those, are you? No, that that is true. The government do lie to us about everything. Oh uh, yes, yeah. Even when there's no need. So the the queen uh, called us up. So we asked her, you know, oh well, w- would you would you like us to um to come up with a sketch for you to be in, or would you like to be involved? in the writing process as well. And she she wanted the, the whole deal. She wanted to be involved in the kind of inception and the writing. The one stipulation that, that she had was that Prince Philip, her, her husband, obviously, should also be included. Um, apparently, any time that you uh, have the Queen in on a project, that's, that's really her one ironclad 
condition. So we were perfectly happy to, to have uh, Prince Philip along as well. And when they arrived on the day, obviously we were we were very nervous, but we felt that what she wanted as a fan of the show, like any other fan of the show, was the was the authentic Monty's experience. So we tried to avoid making any kind of special provisions, too much fanfare. Thought to herself, she gets that all the time. She wants a down to earth, real Monty's uh, experience. Now I'm not actually permitted to discuss the content of the sketch that was recorded and it, it has been decided that it is in effect for Her Majesty's pleasure only. Now part of the reason that we didn't want to release it to the public was because we didn't have the mechanisms in place to deal with with that kind of publicity. It, it would have sent us completely completely off the deep end and we felt it was better to keep the, the enterprise small and true to itself. The other reason, and I I believe I'm I'm permitted to disclose this. Was the racism. Yes. So this is, you know, those of us who have never worked with Prince Philip obviously understand that the the racial overtones of pretty much everything that, that he comes out with is is problematic in the in the modern era. Perhaps in a in a bygone time it would have been okay, but now it's a little bit more difficult. What people don't realise is that it is extraordinarily funny. And I mean really, really incredibly funny. We we didn't script him at all. He was coming up with zingers left, right, and centre. I mean they were they were massively off colour, but it was very, very funny. It had us all in all in stitches, you know. And we felt that it was irresponsible to release that kind of content, not just because of the, you know, racial elements that were that were involved but because we felt that it was funny enough that in the minds of some people perhaps even a lot of people it could have re-legitimized racism and not just as a form of comedy across the board i mean that this was real side splitting stuff and uh, we we didn't want it we didn't want it on our on our consciences really to have to have made it acceptable again in the in the public sphere to do the you know well with the eyes and that sort of stuff well, that does explain his recent appointment to uh, the director of BBC Comedy. That, well, you know, I I think that that does make sense. They they put the warnings at the at the front of the program, but I don't think anyone's ever turned off because of that, have they? No one's ever gone. Oh, contains some humour that might offend. I'll go and throw my radio in the lake. You know, at this point, I I feel like you need to calm down a bit. I, I feel like you've been like very heated with me. I feel like the report has been very like dangerous to a degree where I don't actually feel quite safe sitting here at this point. What? What? I mean, if it wasn't for the fact that I left my taser in the car, I would I would be using it potentially. I, I've shown incredible restraint in, in this situation. I've fed you questions. You didn't have any gum. No, no. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. What is it? Are you sure you're okay? Like, we we can stop. We can get like. Someone to restrain you, perhaps? No, no, it's 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 fine. You definitely don't have enough content here to to get anything out of it. So, please, what what have you got next? Okay, well, sorry, that was just an interview technique. I um, sorry, my, my friend John Walker taught me it's uh, to be incredibly aggressive with your interviewee and try and like upset them enough that you can get a good pull quote, maybe get them to quit entertainment forever. So, do you feel it went well? Yeah, I mean, I can see the reds of your eyes right now, so... Okay, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, the, the technique I like to do to calm you down from this, this mountain you climbed onto... This, this plateau of rage, yeah. Is, uh, so I like to do, like, a, a quick fire round. So, what I'll do is I'll ask you about uh, a member of this group, and uh, you just let me know what you think about those people. I, okay, I can do that. Cool. So, uh, how do you feel about Danny May? Well, I, I I think that he has has really transcended his his medium. I think that Meta was a was a work of of pure genius that has since been ripped off by basically everybody. I mean, especially Charlie Brooker. Like, I can't prove that Charlie Brooker was was stealing his ideas, but Charlie Brooker was definitely stealing his ideas. And uh, Tiff. Tiff is uh, she's she's incredibly incredibly special, and we we were so so lucky to to find her for the show. I mean, when I when I pulled her out from under that collapsed bus stop, I thought, oh, I've got a problem on my hands here. But if, if I'd known how much she was she was going to pay us back in laughs and in creativity and generosity and just bringing light and, and beauty to the world. 
Sorry, you said collapsed bus stop. Uh, yes, yes, uh, that was that was where we initially met. Could you please elaborate on that? When I was out scouting for for Monty's talent, I, I was having a, having a rough time because no one had ever ever heard of it and it had a silly name. But I I saw as as I was uh, walking down to to buy some cans of lager to console myself that the the bus stop near the off license on the hill had had sort of fallen over. It must have been a strong gale or something. It was the autumn, as I recall, quite windy. Well, it is Gravesend. It could have been anything. Oh, yeah. It could have been roving gangs of vandal youths or Ed Price on, on some kind of rampage. But whatever... How, it... how is he doing, by the way? Well, it, it's very it's very difficult to say. My understanding is that he's going through a, a kind of difficult process of, of reinventing himself as a kind of new Ed and... Frankly, so long as he can still come along and and contribute to the show and has the enormous solvent problem under control, I I think that that's you know that's that's enough to keep us happy. I I understand. Uh, so anyway, you were saying it was something about a bus stop falling on top of a person, but again, we're we're in Gravesend. That could that could have been any bus stop. Well, I, I mean, it was one specific bus stop. It could have been any cause of the of the bus stop falling down. But as I as I walked up. To the bus stop, paying it little attention on my quest for alcohol, I heard a I heard a small voice coming from underneath it, and uh, it sounded a bit like "There's a fucking bus stop on top of me." And I thought, well, there must be there must be somebody stuck under here, and I've I've got to help them, you know. So I started trying to trying to lift it up, but it's you know, I mean, they make them out of crap, but they're still quite heavy things. And I got these, you know, I'm a I'm a musician and actor, so I got these little noodle arms i was getting nowhere with the thing luckily just across the way were the were the vagrants who would ordinarily be living in the bus stop wondering about you know their their future and they were more than happy to come across once i once i waved to them and helped me lift up this bus stop and who should be under there but tiff and at the time i didn't know her i just saw a, a person a person in, in a lot of trouble and i was just overcome absolutely overcome by this moment of, of serendipitous fortune I was looking for for somebody for the show, and here under this under this collapsed bus stop, concussed, bruised, swearing, was the answer to my prayers. And in that moment, I knew that that she was the right person for the cast. But how was I going to convince her? As I got her out of the wreckage, and uh, and she thanked me, I asked whether she'd like to come up to the off license as as well, since I was going that way, have a have a beer, drink off some of the some of the injuries, you know. And we, we got to we got to talking along the way. She was at a loose end for for something to do. And once I suggested that, that she should take part in our in our comedy troupe sketch show, she was well, frankly, almost unreasonably enthusiastic. I mean, it is the it's the most enthusiasm I've I've seen from from anybody. I mean, maybe the maybe the concussion hadn't quite worn off yet, and I just struck while the iron was hot, as it were. But ever since then, she's been. Just an extraordinarily valuable member of the Monty team. Even since the concussion's worn off. Well, yeah, I do, you know, I if if indeed it ever did. I mean, I never knew her beforehand, so possibly her decision making skills were at a higher level before then. But certainly in in all the time that that I've known Tiff, she's been yeah extraordinarily happy to to take part and dare I say, a very very valuable member of the team. Well, that that gives me a lot to think about. I I mean, on on the way here, I I saw a collapsed bus stop and heard some voices, but I, I I just assumed that it was the rats. Who knows? Maybe I could have found like a new intern or something. Yes, quite possibly. And it is also worth remembering that you know all those collapsed bus stops are made out of all sorts of bits and bobs that if you need to sort of patch up a hole in your office, for example, then you know a, a bit of bus stop goes a long way. Get some tape on that, baby. I'll keep that in mind. I mean, we we do need to, you know, since the investigators came in, you know, about that hard drive, um, you know, the the office has been kind of a wreck. You know, we used to get the intern to clean it up. Obviously, it got taken away, and no one could just make coffee the same way that I'm used to. Yeah, yeah, it can it can really be it can really be a struggle. I I have to make my own at the Monty office, and I mean that's even you know if the coffee maker is working, which is really fifty fifty. I'll tell you what it is that makes it so difficult, right? It's, it's the fact that if you put the eight sugars in yourself and all the milk and forget the coffee, everyone judges you. But if you ask the intern to do it, 
they won't question you. It's true, it's true. The eight sugars that you can't see is the sweetest eight sugars of all. So, uh, we, we've discussed uh, Tiffany Hanks McComas. So then moving on neatly to uh, Nana Sophie, we mentioned her earlier and her musical exploits and the fact that if she ever tried to uh, take those elsewhere, she would be sued into oblivion or not be able to sing basic words. Oh, absolutely. Uh, what yeah. else do you think about her? Well, Nana is is a wonderful person to, to have on the cast, brings some um, much, much needed diversity that we've been lambasted for lacking in the past by dint of being non-British. She is from Denmark, which I'm sure a lot of people are aware of. And what she brings in terms of, you know, her, her comedy timing, her, her contribution to the atmosphere of the group, her musical ability, you know, absolute star player on the team. One small thing that I have noticed is that she doesn't drink. And and I don't mean just alcohol. I mean, I have never seen her imbibe any kind of liquid substance at any point for any reason. So I think, you know, if you're, if you're looking for a, a follow-up investigation, if you're looking for your Watergate moment here, this could be it. The lack of Watergate, perhaps. Yes, un-Watergate. I'll, I'll keep that in mind. One of the things you mentioned is that Ed's dangerous acting style, I think he comes from like the Stanislavski Lasky class or something weird like that. Exactly. You know, the method acting. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. how do you manage to avoid like going down that dark path yourself, you know, with the clear demons that you have? Well, it's, it's interesting, actually. And uh, it's, an, it's an unconventional strategy. It's, it's not one espoused by, by any other kind of uh, traditional acting methods that, that people are known to follow. But what I like to do is I, I like to imagine myself when when I'm getting into character inside a beautiful golden egg and uh, I, I crouch down and it, it can be anywhere really it can be in the in the living room in the in the kitchen in the in the shower and I'll imagine myself in the egg and and try and envision how the how the character would be would be feeling how they'd react in in different situations. Uh, I, I, did, I did it once at a, at a train station, and it, it can take me hours and hours. I, I remember that um, I was going to audition for a role that, unfortunately, I never got. But it was it was a role as a as a talking toilet paper role uh, in a in an advert for toilet paper. I thought I'm about to get on the train to go to the interview. I need to I need to travel to the to the Golden Egg and try and understand how this talking role of toilet paper would. Would think and and feel and and act. I, I crouched down and I, I disappeared into myself and I became one with with the role. It, it was it was remarkable, really. I, I was so immersed in the experience that people were were coming up to me, concerned bystanders and and station staff. At, at one point, a, a train driver. They were they were prodding me. I mean, you can you can find you can find the footage because it was on CCTV of, of the station, London Victoria. And um, they, they were prodding me. I, I was there. I was there for, for hours and hours, uh, completely unresponsive, envisioning myself in, in the role, in the egg. And uh, unfortunately, I, I missed every train that day. And you say you didn't get the role? Alas, no. No. Oh, that sounds like a shame. Um, so the final member we have to talk about is uh, Richie Mansfield. Yes. Yeah. Richie, of course. What would, you, what would you like to know about I'd him? just like to know your opinion of him, I guess. You've, you've given your opinion on everyone else. I I now know that, you know, Nana yep. should drink anything. Yeah. Tiff was a, a bus stop baby of some kind. In, in a sense. So uh, the only person you haven't given an opinion on, uh, apart from Shumway, who I, I assume isn't actually part of, a, of the troupe, would be Richie Mansfield. Well, uh, Richie, Richie's a very interesting person, you know. I, I think that he has a, a natural knack for for comedy. I think that he's he's an extraordinarily good writer, and I, I think he's a, he's an excellent performer as well. And in a in an ideal world, there there'd be a way that I could I could exploit more of his kind of performative talents and bring more of that to the show. But as I already perform the voice of Richie. There isn't, there isn't really a, a space for him to fit into. I, I hope to find one, but there's just not a space for him at this moment. I see. So eventually, you would, you know, be able to like work with him in order to sort of like create these roles a bit deeper. Because as you know, Richie voices quite a lot of characters, such as you know, uh, Sir Frank, uh, as as you said earlier, Sir Frank Dinner. Uh, yes, I believe yeah. there's uh, another one. 
uh, maybe a third one and a fourth one. Uh, there, there, there are there are several, yes. And do you say that you voice all of them? Well, um, yeah, yes. Uh, I'm I'm not aware that that was wasn't common knowledge. But people have met Richie. Yes. So why would you voice like if you know what I mean like? You've done the fan meetups. You've done interviews. Yeah, yeah. There's so That's you're true. saying that in all those circumstances, the Richie who was there was you. No, 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 no. That's Richie. Okay, so th- this is where I'm struggling to understand. So yeah. you voice Richie in all of the sketches. Everyone. But there is a Richie Mansfield that comes to all of the press screenings and the fan meets with you. Yes, and that is Richie Mansfield. Okay, but Richie Mansfield doesn't voice. Richie in the show even though he sounds identical to the voice that you put on for him uh yes yeah that's correct that's voiced by me and um Richie was was obviously a huge inspiration for for all of those voices all of those characters instead like so is this what like a creamer situation from Seinfeld or is this just like you what what what's going on here well, I I think I've explained it as as well as I possibly can. You know, I'm looking for some way to to incorporate Richie more into the show, but since I already do all of those voices at, at the moment, they're just you know until until we find something new for him, there just isn't a space. Okay, so so bear with me a second. So run okay. this through with me. Yes, you like Richie as a person. Absolutely, he's fantastic. Uh, enough to create an entire character and series of characters based on him and his voice. Yes. And then you use him for fan meetups and for press screenings and say, this is Richie. Yes. But at no point has he actually voiced Richie in the show, even though he is Richie. Yeah, exactly. Yes, thank you. But why didn't you just hire Richie to do all that? Surely that would have been a lot less strain on your voice. So, so what I think that you're you're not understanding is is kind of the the world of audio recording. If you want something that sounds like Richie on the show, you can't just use Richie. What people sound like in a in a room or in a in a public forum at a convention is not reflective of what they're going to sound like once they've been put through all the you know ring modulators and and compressors and and equalizers. It, it, it just you know, it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be viable, and it's it's almost crazy to suggest. But Richie has been like filmed and used in all these interviews, and he sounds identical to how he does in the show. So why don't you just use Richie? Because it, as I explained, you know, it's it's a very delicate setup that we have, and if if we made a change at this point. I mean, imagine the the volume of of letters and complaints we'd have going. Oh, you know, oh, who's that doing the Richie voice? It all sounds wrong now. It'd be it's it's wrong sounding Muppets. You know, I, I don't I don't think that the the fans would follow us on that journey. Much as I'd love to to give Richie more to do, the man's a genius. But the voices are identical. Well, you know, to to the to the untrained ear in these different scenarios, but you've never you've never heard him on the show, and th- there's a good reason for that. Bear with me. This is going to be a very hard hitting journalistic question. I know uh, you've been mm-hmm. very used to those from me. In fact, I you know, if anything, this is probably going to be the knockout punch because you know I've been hitting you, I've been you know sw- bobbing to and fro. You know, you've not been able to like get a single thing back on me. Like in terms of you know boxing, I am. The journalistic equivalent of, say, like Glass Joe. And what I need to ask you is this Could it be that Richie doesn't voice Richie in the show because until this moment you have never considered it as an option? Well, no. I mean, it, obviously it was never on the table. Because, uh, but why wasn't it on the table? Because, as I've as I've explained, it it simply it simply wouldn't wouldn't work i'm already the the voice of did you ever try well no because you can see on and why didn't you try uh, on on paper even just in in the in the abstract it's it's an experiment that doesn't even need conducting to to see that it it would fail and why would it fail because of the the sounding different and the the ring mod i explained about the ring modulator what do you want from me i just want you to admit that you never until this moment considered to actually just use Richie himself. 
Okay, I never thought of it. Thank you. That was a lot easier than the thing about the ring nodulators, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I don't even I don't even know what one of those is. Uh, I, I heard about it on a on a Doctor Who documentary. Okay, and with that bombshell, I finally got the bit of gotcha journalism that I needed all along. So, I I think I'll be leaving. Well, 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 well. hold on for for just a moment here, because it, it does occur to me that probably you know we're. We're a little bit over time, and and there's there's some there's some material there that could that could probably be be lost along the the way to make it fit a bit more neatly. Do you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, I mean, I I, I don't know how many people are going to be willing to listen to like a show that goes from like thirty minutes to like nearly an hour. I think that is we are kind of stretching the limitations of what we expect the audience to be able to uh, like bear with so to speak. Yeah, so I, I think really it's it's probably for for the best, you know, for the for the sake of the audience. If we were to take that that last segment with the, you know, who cares who voices Richie and who never thought of what straightforward idea. You know, I let's let's keep it let's keep it about the the kind of, you know, fun facts and and fluffy fluffy anecdotes. So if there's a if there's maybe a way that we could, you know, take take that whole section out I, th- I think that would probably probably be for the best i mean i might take the nsfe section out because if we do do the investigation we don't really want to tip her off so to speak it might make the you know she might start you know drinking things just to throw people off the scent so i might cut those bits but again i you know it's yeah i mean there's there's quite a lot here i, I there's stuff to work around you know I'll, I'll i'll think about it maybe okay but but the the richie part you know that that went on for for quite a time, I think it's probably safe to just just lose the whole thing. It really, as a as a personal favour to me, I'd I'd really appreciate it if if that could uh, if that could not make the final edit. Is that is that something you can do? Can you take that out? I'm I mean that that was one of the the, the shortest bits I think by by my stopwatch here. So I I think people have the right to know. Okay, uh, cl- clearly you're you're savvier than than I've given you credit for. What what does savvy mean? Sorry. The it's it's really it's really not important, but I think that we might be able to come to some kind of uh, let's say financial arrangement. You know, you've you've gone to a lot of trouble to come here. It's taken a lot of your time. It was on short notice. You know, maybe if if you were to take out the the Richie part and I were to give you say twenty pounds, you know, for for your trouble and your travel and and so forth. How does that sound? I mean. That might just about pay for the the Uber. I'm not sure. Right. Well, well, well. You you, you drive a you drive a hard bargain. Let me just uh, let me just get my <clears throat> financials here. And f- forty forty pounds. That's that's twice. That's twice the amount. That's two two Ubers of whatever distance is. You know. That's I think that's perfectly fair. Two twenties. That doesn't sound like. A lot, because that is two of 20, and 20 is not that big a number, I think. Right, okay, 40, 45, 45 pounds, that's, that's all, that's literally all there is here, and, and you can, you can have absolutely a lot of it, just please, the, the Richie part, just take it out, everything else can stay. Uh, I don't know, um, I, 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 I can think about when I'm on the way to get some food on the way back. Okay, 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 I've also got a sandwich, you don't have to worry about the food. Got a sandwich, you can, 45 pounds and a sandwich. What what kind of sandwich? It's a cheese sandwich. What kind of cheese? What kind of okay? It's just cheddar. I think it's cheddar cheese. I don't know if it's you know medium or or mature. It's not mild. It's it's one of the good ones. You know cheddar cheddar cheese sandwich. Uh, I'm more of a red Leicester man, to be fair. You know. Oh, okay, right. I'll I'll get you. I'll get you Red Leicester. I'll I'll go to the. You you can stay here, or you can come with me. I'll go to the shop. I'll get you the Red Leicester. I, I will replace the cheese in the sandwich with with Red Leicester. You can even you can keep the cheddar as well if you if you want and do do whatever you want with it. We've got the forty five pounds. We got the the Red Leicester sandwich. We have got the the extra cheddar that you can keep. Just please. What kind of bread? The it's. No, white, normal white bread, uh, thick sliced. I think. Ah, uh, see, I'm really more of a like an end piece man, you know. Well, they're, they're, I still have. I don't eat them. I still have both the end pieces for this loaf. You can have the end if it's that important to you. You can have the end pieces from from the loaf. Okay. Um. Can you take the crusts off? 
the crust off the end pieces. Yeah, that that that's how I like my sandwiches. I like them with the end pieces. I like them as end pieces with the crust taken off. How is that not exactly the same as bread from the middle of the loaf? If you don't understand, it's perfectly, you know, I, I can just go, I can take this recording, and I'll show it to someone who does understand. Right, no, 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 no. Okay, you can have £45, a bespoke sandwich made to your specifications. Just please don't let that recording see the light of day. And it doesn't matter that I don't know how to edit and wouldn't be able to take it off the recording anyway. Of course that matters! Oh, I I didn't realise that that was important to you how how was any of this going to who does the editing who removes the parts who makes this all make sense i usually just give some notes to the intern right okay well can you can you tell the intern then in exchange for the the money and the the sandwich to please take out the part about the richie voice and the what have you i i i mean i can try but i'm not really allowed to send him any missives while he's like in prison, like it tends to get like you know they sort of go through like a fine tooth comb in order to make sure there's like no <sighs> hidden messages or anything like that. So it will probably take a while. Right. O- like, okay. How how long can you wait? The important thing is is that it gets removed. the The time frame isn't an issue. So long as so long as you can promise me that this isn't going to make it into the into the public domain, please take take your money, take your sandwich, and be on your merry way. I'll try. No, hold on. I can't promise I'll try. Uh, I can promise that I'll think about trying. I I think at this point that's going to have to do. Okay then, deal. Well, thank you so much for for having me, and it's it's been an absolute joy to to share all of these fun facts and fluffy anecdotes about the show with with our listeners. Yeah, and I think the audience will be really you know happy to hear the anecdote about how you voice Richie. Okay, you see what you've done. Oh, right. Sorry, sorry. Um, let me try that again. Um, yes, it was very good to talk to you about all of the things that we can talk about. Yeah, okay. But I, I think they can fix that in, in post. Oh, probably. I'll, I'll just get a new intern. What, I mean, what do people pay them? Nothing? Well, they're, they're ten That's a penny, right. really, aren't they? I mean, they're more than ten a penny. They're, they're theoretically infinite per penny. I could get ten interns. Interesting. Well, thank you very much. This has been eye-opening for me. Well, uh, wonderful. I I look forward to it and um, wish you the absolute best with all of the forthcoming, you know, court proceedings, testimonials, tribunals, so on and so forth. Well, I mean, I don't I don't need to go. I I told them that I had nothing to do with it, and they believe me. So I should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Let's go with that. All right, cool. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'll just I'll I'll I'll, I'll just start heading now. Uh, is is the front door this way? How do how do you open the front door? Is it? Yeah, ju- just through there, like, just through there, and then then left. Okay, okay, but it, how, what do you do with the handle? Is it like a turn left, or is it a turn right, or is it an up or down? The or? okay, right, just it. You sort of you push and turn, and then just sort of follow. As the smell gets stronger, you're you're getting towards the exit. All right, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah. Yeah, can you, you can smell no, it this, now. This yeah. is really overpowering. Oh, Jesus, yeah. Like, what, what do you keep in here? I, it's, it's Shumway's closet. We try not to ask. Uh, okay, uh, well, bye. Okay, bye. bye. Oh, did I, are you off? Oh, yeah, no, I've, I've just finished the interview with Danny May, you know. Well, just I, I, I couldn't help over hearing now that you, uh, you need someone to, someone to edit this, do you? Yeah, it's it's just you know I've never well, touched a computer in my life. Oh, oh, do you know how to use computers? Oh, the, the, yeah, the uh, you know the the windows and that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I could, oh, I could do that for you. The the. Uh, I mean, it sounds like you're cloud. an expert. You, oh, are you yeah, all, what, you know, I've, I've I don't even know what a sound. Did you say sound cloud? Sound cloud. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sound, right, okay. Uh, that's my. Uh, that's my. Uh, just let me hear this. That's my. Uh, that's my preferred. That's my preferred. Yeah, I could do that for you. Uh, how long is it? Uh, it's, uh, I think I think it's about an hour. Maybe we just edit it down to about forty minutes. I'll tell minutes. you what I'll do. So, uh, I'll do you a uh, pound a minute. How about that? It's sixty quid. Sixty fifty quid. quid. Uh, fifty. Uh, I mean forty five quid. Fifty five quid. Uh, uh, fifty five. 50. I mean, all all I've got here is this. I've got this cheese sandwich, and uh, Danny gave me forty five quid to not air something like quite. Has he got tetris. salad in it? Or? No, it's it's just um, it's uh, red Leicester. It's the end pieces with the crust taken off, just the way I like it. Any pickle in there, or...? 
Not really. No, I'm, I'm not really a pickle. I mean, I, I suppose I could buy you a McDonald's and take the pickles out of that and put it in the sandwich. Yeah, it's not really the same, though, is it? Uh, all right, then. So we'll be saying 35 in the sandwich? Uh, 45 in the sandwich? 28 uh, in the sandwich? I mean, he, he gave me 45. He gave me 45 in no, the well, sandwich. No, well, 45. 45 in the sandwich then, yeah? All right, okay. 55 in the sandwich. That's my final offer. Uh, let me have a look at the sandwich. The, it's like, like I say, it's just red Leicester with end pieces with the crust taken off. Well, you drive a hard bargain, but uh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that for you. Uh, yeah, send me, send me the... Uh, Send me the wave files. Well, I'll, well, what I'll do is I'll just give you this recording device and you can just edit oh, it. Oh, that would be perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah The one yeah. thing I need to make yeah, very, yeah. very clear no, no, is... No, no, uh, no, no. Yeah, just give me that. Yeah. yeah it's no, just fine. It's, yeah. It's the, the, the main condition is that there's... Um, what make is that? that? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think Tascam, maybe? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen... I've, I've seen... Uh, what do you reckon that goes for, then? Just like, uh, you know, cash converters or something. Uh, I, I, I don't know. It was just given to me brand new by the office. Um, oh, well, well but, yeah, terrific. Well, just, yeah, just give me, just give me that. You keep the fucking zen. All right. Well, I, I just need to make <laughs> just, it very no, clear well, that... No, uh, no, I just, I'll just take this with me. Okay. I just uh, need no, to it's it fine. Very clear that you no. need to edit out the bit where... Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I got you. Oh, I'm a professional, I'm, mate. I'm not allowed I'm, to I'm, hear I'm, that. I'm just a professional. Take out the bit where Dad admits that he's Richie and has been all these years. Honestly. Trust me, old son, I've done this bit.